Good afternoon. My name is Vincent Emanuele. I am a resident of Indiana, and I served with the United States Marine Corps from September 2002 through January of 2006 with the 1st Battalion, 7th Marines, Alpha Company, 3rd Platoon, 1st Squad. I was deployed twice to the Middle East, the first in March 2003 to Kuwait, immediately following my School of Infantry training. This deployment was cut short due to my mother enduring a brain aneurysm. I was deployed again in August of 2004, where I spent my time in Iraq as a rifleman in 1st Squad. Our area of operation was a small border town a mile south of the Euphrates and 10 miles east of Syria called al Qaim, Iraq. The issues I will be discussing today include rules of engagement or the breakdown thereof, the death of innocents, the destruction of civilian property, and the mishandling of the dead. An act that took place quite often in Iraq was that of taking pop shots at cars that drove by. This was quite easy for most Marines to get away with because of our rules of engagement stated that the town of Al-Qaim had already been forewarned and knew to pull their cars to a complete stop when approaching a United States convoy. Our rules of engagement stated that we should first fire warning shots into the ground in front of the car, then the engine block, and then the windshield. That is, if the car was even moving in the first place. Many, many times, cars that actually had pulled off to the side of the road were also shot at. Of course, the consequences of such actions pose a huge problem for those of us who patrol the streets every day. This was not the best way to come, become friendlier with an already hostile local population. This was not an isolated incident, and it took place for most of our eight-month deployment. Another incident occurred when we were sent out on a mission to blow up a bridge that was supposedly being used to transport weapons across the Euphrates. During this mission, we were ambushed and we were forced to return fire in order to make our way out of the city. This incident took place in the middle of the day, and most of those who were engaging us were not in clear view. Many had hidden local houses and businesses and were part of the local population themselves. Once again, making it very hard to determine who was shooting from where and where exactly to return fire. This led to our squad shooting at everything and anything, i.e. properties, cars, people, in order to push through the town. I remember firing myself into the town during this firefight and while emptying, emptying most of my magazines issued to me, not once did I clearly identify the targets that I was shooting at. The retrans site, otherwise known as a retransmission site, was a communications post set up on a plateau overlooking the town of al -Kaim. This communications site was there to provide communication between the main base at the railroad station where we were and an outpost called Husseba, where Bravo Company's area of operations took place. We would encounter mortar fire on a daily basis. Most of the time, we would return this fire with mortar fire of our own. Some of the time, our counter battery would call in a specific location for us to exchange fire. On occasion, when the counter battery could not call in a specific location, we would fire anyway. Sometimes in the hills off to the west of the town, where we had thought the mortar fire was coming from, and other times straight onto the town of Alcam itself, on buildings, houses, and businesses. Because of the lack of personnel at the retrans site, very rarely, if ever, did we conduct a battle damage assessment to report civilian deaths and destruction. So almost all of the time, these incidents went unreported and non-investigated. Once we were taking rocket fire from a town, and a member from our squad mistakenly identified a tire shop as being the place where the rocket fire came from, sure enough, we mortared the shop. This was one of the only times we had actually had the chance to investigate what it was we had done and to be able to talk to the people that we had uh, directly affected. Luckily, the family who owned the shop was still alive. However, we were not able to compensate the family, nor were, we, nor were we able to explain how it was he could rebuild his livelihood. This was not an isolated incident and once again took place over the course of our eight-month deployment. Another task our platoon was asked to take on was that of transporting prisoners from our base back to the desert. The reason I say the desert and not their town is because that is exactly where we would drop them off, in the middle of nowhere. Now, most of these men had obviously been deemed innocent or else they would have been moved to a more permanent prison and not released back into the population. Needless to say, we took it upon ourselves to punch, kick, butt stroke, or generally harass these prisoners until the point at which we would take them in the middle of the desert, throw them out of the back of our Humvees while continually kicking, punching, and at times even throwing softball-sized rocks at their backs as they ran away from our convoy. Once again, this is not an isolated incident, and this took place over the duration of our eight-month deployment. 
The last and possibly the most disturbing of what took place in Iraq was the mishandling of the dead. On several occasions, our convoy came across bodies that had been decapitated and were lying on the side of the road. When encountering these bodies, standard procedure was to run over the corpses, sometimes even stopping and taking pictures with these bodies, which was also standard practice whenever we encountered the dead. This along with neglecting to account for many of those who were killed and wounded. On one specific occasion, after I had shot a man in the back of the head after we had run him down from planting an IED device, um, we pulled his body out of the ditch he was laying in and we subsequently left his body there to rot in the field where we saw the body again up to two weeks later. This, um, <clears throat> there was also a picture, pictures taken of, of this gentleman and for me personally it was um, very hard when, when our squad returned back to the uh, to our main base after I had killed the man. His picture was on the backdrop of a laptop for a screensaver from one of our more motivated Marines. Um, and so these, uh, once again, these, they're the, the, the point that I'd really try to get across here is that these are not isolated incidents. And the incidents that I've mentioned here today took place over the course of eight months. And the larger point that I'd like to touch on is, you know, this, these are the consequences for sending young men and women to battle. These are the things that happen. Um, and what I'd like to do, or what I'd like to ask anyone who's witnessing this or anyone who's viewing this testimony is to imagine your loved ones um, put in such positions, your brothers, your sisters, your nieces, your nephews, and your aunts and your uncles. And m more importantly, and maybe most importantly, to be able to put ourselves in the Iraqi shoes who encountered these events every day and have for the last five years. Thank you very much.